How do you use heart rate variability as a metric in your practice and or in your own personal use? Sleep, pre-post exercise, pre-post eating, every morning readiness? Yeah, I mean, I, I so when I started getting into heart rate variability, it was long before there were commercial, you know, like rings and wearables that were making it easy to track. And um, so, um, God, I'm blanking on the guy's name who got me into it. His name is Will Eden, works for Peter Thiel. Um, and I i don't know how I met Will, um, but, you know, we had a bunch of friends in common and somehow we met and um, it was about probably like six years ago. And I went up and spent a day in Peter's office and um, he was showing me like the raw data on their heart math. So heart math was a company that was running the algorithm on chest strap. So you have a chest strap that was gathering the data and then heart math was the algorithm you're doing it. And I was really impressed by the data. Roughly speaking, what is heart rate variability? I guess it's worth defining this. Uh, this would be another great whiteboard discussion, but um, why didn't we get a little like, we should have had like a little post-it, like a little white little flip chart here. We could, we could just draw on the walls too. I'm sure your kids do it sometimes. You wanna hear a funny story about this? Yeah. So I got in really late last night and uh, but it was still early enough that somehow my son, Reese was up. I, but I, like as I landed, he's just getting ready to go to bed. And I'm like, oh, I, I just I want to like FaceTime him. Right. So we have this thing where I tell him stories every night. And I don't know where this came from, but like I just decided the name of the character was Reginald. I just love the name Reginald. Right. So I'm like, Reginald is a four year old boy who has a younger brother and an older sister. And it's like everything is about Reese, except it's not about Reese. It's Reginald. And Reese is obsessed with trash cans, but Reginald's obsessed with helicopters. So we're into a sweet Reginald story. And you can see my wife is sitting next to him and she's like kind of rolling her eyes, like, come on, get on with it. Get on with it. Get on. Like, I got to get this kid to bed. And I'm like, so I was like, I got to make it a quick story. So I'm like, one day Reginald wanted to draw a picture but he couldn't find any paper. So he grabbed his markers and he drew a big helicopter on the wall. And Reese like sits up and he goes, he did what? And I hear my wife go, good story, dad. And I'm like, oh, I mean, but after he drew the helicopter on the wall, he was grounded for a month and never allowed to draw again. And da, 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 da. I had to like walk myself back up. It's <laughs> a good save. Um, I think dads just do that. Like, I, I oh, think yeah. we just give kids bad ideas and we don't realize it because we foot think and, foot and mouth disease, I think is <laughs> the term. Yeah, I think so. Even the, like today I heard it, I heard about it again. She's like, he's still talking about Reginald drawing on the wall. <laughs> like, just so you know, when that happens, you're the one painting it. It was like, I'm yeah. fine. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to tell a story. Um, what was I talking about so drawing? HRV. Oh, HRV, yeah. right. So so when you look at a, this, will like, so, so people listening to this, I'm sorry, this won't make much sense, but if you're watching this, hopefully you'll see this. So when you look at an EKG, which you probably appreciate is there's like this little P wave, which is the atrial contraction. And then there's the little down tick of the Q, the R and the S wave, and that's the ventricular contraction. And then there's the T wave, which is the repolarization. And so that is like one heartbeat, P, Dip Q, spike R, S, T. Can people see that, oh, Nick, when I'm doing that? I All bet right, I cool. can figure out the technology that it like makes. When you're doing that, we can make the, the sinus <laughs> wave. That, that would be very QRS. Rhonda, Patrick. Yeah. Rhonda would do that. Yeah, that's, that's, cool. that's, 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 Rhonda would take it to yeah. that level. I, we might be too lazy. Maybe. Um, okay, so let's say somebody's heart rate is beating 60 times per minute. They're, they're at rest. The length of time between those R waves, because the spike of the R wave is the most obvious place to measure the beat to beat time, would be one second, right? 60 beats per minute. If you're beating 120 beats per minute, it would be half a second or 500 milliseconds. So what heart rate variability is doing is asking the question, how much variability is there between those beats? And you might think, mm -hmm. well, if you're just sitting there at rest, how much variability can there be? And the answer is it depends on what time scale you're using to measure it. If you're just measuring it in seconds, not much at all. But if you're measuring it in one thousandths of a second or milliseconds, there could be quite a bit. So somebody whose EKG or you know heart rate measurement looks like it's chugging along at 60 beats per minute, it might still be you know 970 milliseconds, 1,030 milliseconds, 1,005 milliseconds, 970 milliseconds, etc. 
there's a mathematical um, um, algorithm that you applied uh, that you applied to that called the root mean square of the standard deviation that basically our MSSD yep. that basically turns that number. It's a transformation. So it's, it's in mathematics, we call these things transformations where you basically compress these numbers and um, you can then now measure how much variability there's going on. Okay. I don't want to get much more into the math on that um, in large part because I actually don't, I'm not, I'm, you know, like I'm not an expert on this topic. There's a little bit of this on the, the Lustig podcast. That's right. We yeah. Little, we talked about the high, like the, the high frequency versus the low yeah, frequency. That's right. Of, and we included that in the show notes. So that's, that's like helpful. Looking at the difference between the RR intervals or something like that. Well, the RR interval is the raw data. Like, yeah. so, so I'll back up for a moment. So when I got really into this, there were basically only two companies that were doing the analysis, HeartMath and um, uh, First Beat. Um, I chose to work with first beat, even though I would say at the time, both of their algorithms were excellent, but the first beat was a, you actually, it came with its own like little EKG thing. So it came with a, you would put a sticker here and you'd put a sticker here. Um, and, and basically you hung this little battery packed wire across your chest. So like a couple of leads under, you had a couple of leads. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, it was actually funny because the, the the stickiness of their leads was so profound. I, I have like leather skin, like nothing can hurt me. I was like completely to tore my skin off. I was like for a year or two years after I started using it, I was depigmented where I had those leads. It was like, um, so we ended up like realizing, well, this is gonna be really hard to do with patients. Mm -hmm. So they came out with like a less sticky lead and we, you know, we got away with it. But, um, it would capture the data, then you would actually have to send the device, um, you know, you'd have to plug the device into your computer and it would, you know, sort of do the analysis. Um, before I get to what I do today, the more important point is what did that data tell us? What were we looking for? So we were looking for several things. So the device could measure heart rate, heart rate variability and respiratory rate. Obviously it has the, it's an, it, it has the sensitivity to measure the thoracic mm -hmm. movement. It would use an algorithm, first beat had an algorithm, and I'm sure HeartMath has its own algorithm, and they're both proprietary, to impute from that whether they believed that the user was in a more parasympathetic or sympathetic state or under a period of profound stress like exercise. So if heart rate variability became very low and heart rate and respiratory rate were high, it would basically impute that to be you are exercising, and it would graphically represent that one way. If heart rate were low, heart rate variability were high, it would interpret that as low sympathetic tone, low fight or flight tone, mm. high parasympathetic tone. It would represent that a certain way. And you can you know, extrapolate from there. So the, the, the advantage of this is you could get really cool data and you would typically have the patient wear this for three days, um, taking it off only to shower. Um, so they would exercise with it, they would sleep with it, they would change the lead once a day. Um, it, it became a really helpful way for us to try to look at sleep patterns. Um, the problem is the compliance was very low. Most patients didn't want to do it and it took so long to get the data. You know, if a patient was in New York doing this, they'd have to mail the thing back to, you know, Mary in San Diego and it was just kind of a pain in the ass. So. The, the products like Aura Ring or, you know, there's others like, you know, Whoop tries to do this, Motive tries to do this. Um, I can't speak to their technology as well. Um, but nevertheless, now we can basically get those data every day when we wake up, just looking at the data from our wearable. So as a general rule, you want to see higher heart rate variability because that's a marker of more parasympathetic flow, provided again, it's being measured mm -hmm. correctly. Um, you so so the things that I've observed so so when you when you look at the recovery index on the Aura Ring, which is one of its menus, what it's basically doing is using a lot of data, but one of them is the parasympathetic, uh, the the heart rate variability. So as you overtrain, your heart rate variability will go down, your resting heart rate will go up. Um, I think I've talked about this in the past, but I mean, you know, alcohol and shitty food close to bedtime will absolutely tank my resting heart rate, meaning it will drive it mm -hmm. way up and will drive my heart rate variability down. And it's not subtle. It's not like, mm -hmm. well, that's on the edge. No, no, no. Like it's because you see the tracing of the data overnight. It's only reporting the average and the max, but you can just look at the raw data and it's pretty clear that, you know, those things, you know, really diminish 
um, th those parameters and, and by extension, then your, your recovery and your sleep quality. So heart rate variability then becomes one of the parameters along with temperature, movement, et cetera, that then feeds into the algorithms that predict sleep quality and recovery. Hmm. Again, you, I've kind of forgot the question, but I know it had to do with heart rate variability. Yeah. Um, how you use it in the practice and personally, and yeah. I'm wondering, like, do, do you, is it actionable? I mean, you've talked about doing deadlifts and saying, I forget the number, but it's, it's not small where you say you'll, you, you're doing deadlifts, you'll warm up, you'll, you're, you're going to be warming up to a heavy mm -hmm. and then you actually, you walk away cause you're not feeling it that day. Is there anything that you look at it with the HRV, the readiness or things like that and say, I, absolutely, I'm feeling great, but this thing is telling me. Absolutely. I, 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 so there's two things that are really valuable. The first is. And this gets to the point we made with the CGM, which is real-time feedback is awesome. Take away real-time feedback, it's hard to do anything. I mean, everybody's heard the famous experiments when you put on a headphone that delays your voice, you hearing your voice by a few seconds, you can't carry on for more than a sentence. Oh, yeah. Right? I've, I've experienced that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's actually, that's horrible. That's like negative feedback. That's not yeah. just taking away the feedback. That's like actually inserting negative feedback, which is incredibly destructive. So the first thing is when I wake up in the morning and I see that my HRV or my heart rate or my temperature or my respiratory rate is off. And again, I have my parameters. I know what I want to be. I immediately can say, what did you do different? I mean, that's how I sort of figured out what my tolerance for alcohol was. You can have one drink, don't have two. Mm. And by the way, one's not even good. Like one gives you slight hit, two is a brick over the head. Um, and probably what time are you drinking? Yeah, that like when are you that? drinking that? And then like uh, that's how I've certainly figured out like meal timing. Like oh boy, you're eating a little too close to bed. Like that's not good. Room temperature. Like all you know, mm. all of the the crap that I do is largely based on this empirical iterative tinkering approach, which allows me to have data. And then of course by giving patients these devices, you can figure out what's true for a patient because it might necessarily be true for me. So in many ways I'm trying to help a patient understand how they can do the tinkering so that they can figure out their optimal state. I mean, I, for example, I like a room to be as cold as is humanly possible. I mean, if it's like, if I don't get under the covers and feel incredibly uncomfortable, I'm going to be too hot mm -hmm. uh, by, by my standards. But that, you know, that might be not at all your standard, right? So, um, so, so that's that. And then to your point, yeah, the readiness score for me, especially when I'm starting to feel a little sick, Sometimes that readiness score becomes the harbinger of that. And, um, you know, I like to see, and also it also gives me some inclination. You'll, you'll often see it dip after you've had two consecutive days of really hard workouts. Now, I will say this. I don't think it's as sensitive to lifting workouts. So it doesn't seem to possess the ability to distinguish between like, you did deadlifts until you puked versus you, you know, you were at the hotel gym and you did leg press. Like it can't, it, but what it sure as hell knows is like you went out and, you know, expended 1500 kilojoules yesterday on a bike or, you know, mm. a thousand kilojoules in a run where you ran at, you know, seven minute miles. Like it knows that. And it, you, you, you stack a couple of those days on top of each other and it says, wow, that's, that's serious mm. almost. Um, I'd love to see the data on, you know, because I, I, I think a couple of uh, teams in the Tour de France wore the Aura Ring this year. I'd love to see what those data were like. Th their recovery scores must have been uh, the lowest numbers imaginable because mm -hmm. of the physiologic stress they're under. So yeah. despite the fact that they're so fit and like, you know, the most remarkable physical specimens, you, you know. I mean, and you look at the sort of the trend over the course of the three weeks yeah. and see the dip. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting. Oh, I, 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 I need to make a note to because I. I'd like to follow up and see if they've, if anyone's ever been willing to share those data. And you mentioned, you may have mentioned this before, but on your, when you fasted, you did a week long fast. You said your sleep was remarkable. Yes. Did the aura ring, did that, did it corroborate it in any way? When you looked at the, the data from the aura ring, that it tells you anything? REM it sleep, deep sleep. Yeah. Uh, the biggest, the, the deep sleep is what went up the most. So the deep sleep went up mm. the most, the light sleep went down the least, uh, went down the most. So lights, so stage one and two went down, stage three and four went up. REM was about unchanged. HRV was higher. Mm. Um, resting heart rate was good, was like what you would, was, it, resting heart rate was on par with what it is if you're not eating and drinking before bed. Um, I'm trying to think what else, I have to go back and look. I think re respiratory rate went down which I, I think is a VCO2 thing. I think that the, 
shittier and more carby a meal is before bed, the higher your VCO2, you're really trying to blow off more of that CO2. Yeah. We know that your respiratory quotient is higher. So unless your VO2 is going up, your VCO2 has to be the thing that's going up more. That would, wouldn't surprise me to see respiratory rate go up a little mm. bit. And anecdotally, that's at least what I think I'm seeing. Interesting.